When I was five, my parents divorced. My mother, having been close to the mental health profession earlier in her life, decided to take me to a child psychologist to help cope with the transition. I struggled greatly in the beginning, adjusting to life outside of the blended family that I had once grown up in. Like many children of divorce, I began to experience adverse symptoms relatively quickly. Just give Derek time, everyone said. He'll adjust. But after a couple of months, things weren't better. In fact, they were much worse. Still, even my doctors, even my child psychologist were convinced that given a little more time and a little more therapy, I'd be okay. Everything that Derek is experiencing, they said, is completely normal. But what they and everyone else who knew and loved me did not know was that at that exact same time, right underneath their noses, I was being sexually abused. After my parents' divorce, I was allowed to spend every other weekend at my father's. In fact, it was during these weekend visits where my abuse began, not at the hands of my father, but at the hands of somebody that I knew and loved and trusted. The thing to keep in mind about sexual predators is that they'll do anything to stay concealed, anything. They'll lie to you, they'll intimidate you, and they'll threaten you. In my case, all three of those things were true. I was told that if I disclosed my abuse that my parents wouldn't love me anymore. I was threatened and intimidated. But none of those threats were as effective as this one, that if I told anyone what was happening to me, that Santa Claus wouldn't come visit me that year and everyone would know what a bad little boy I had been. And so, like any five-year-old would, I stayed quiet. Months passed, and I desperately wanted to tell somebody, anybody, what was happening to me, but I also wanted Santa Claus to come down that chimney. The following year, the abuse continued, and as Christmas approached, I just couldn't take it anymore. Riddled with guilt and shame, I found myself unable to sleep. This, I resolved, would be the year that I just wouldn't get any presents. I had to tell somebody. I remember waking up with a pit in my stomach, peeling off the covers, getting out of bed, and tiptoeing downstairs to find my mom alone on the sofa watching television. She took one look at me and knew that something wasn't right. What's wrong? She asked, and I burst into tears and began to tell her everything. Now, keep in mind that when a child does disclose sexual abuse, they often won't use those terms because they don't know what terms to use. Instead, what they'll do sometimes is describe in rather graphic detail everything that's happening to them. And so that's exactly what I did as my mother sat and listened in horror. I can only imagine what that must have been like for her. I don't remember much else about that night, but I do remember this that my mom did everything that someone in her position should have done. She listened to me, she believed me, and she told me that there was nothing that I could ever do to lose her love. Best of all, she let me know that Santa Claus was definitely going to come visit me that year. And I remember feeling relieved, like a million pound weight had been lifted off my chest, relieved that all of this was finally over. But what I could never have known is that that night was just the beginning. Because disclosing my abuse was the equivalent of pulling the pin on a grenade and rolling it into the middle of what little family I had left. Complete and total destruction. Not everyone in my family believed me, it turned out. And as time passed, things got worse for me. I began to experience adverse symptoms of sexual abuse, now commonly referred to as PTSD. I developed an eating disorder, an obsessive compulsive disorder, insomnia, night terrors, a nervous tick. And everyone kept telling me that what had happened to me wasn't my fault. And I kept thinking that if none of this were my fault, then why did it feel like it was? I mean, shouldn't all of these things be happening to the person who had done this to me? I resolved even at that early age, and I remember thinking even back then that no matter what, I could never and I would never forgive the person who would sexually abuse me. Just look at all of the damage they had caused. As I grew into adolescence and entered into high school, things got much worse.
I began participating in risky behavior, and I started doing things that I thought would help other people to like me more, to only wind up hurting myself. I was in constant survival mode, and it was beginning to take its toll. And this was never more apparent than during my very first semester when away at college and away from the few friends and family that I had grown to rely on for the very first time, I found myself completely and utterly alone. And I sank into a deep and dark depression, one so bad I thought that there would be no escape. And so it was then, during my very first semester away at school, that I decided to do the unthinkable and end my suffering. I remember sitting in class one day when the thought came to me, this would be the day. And I remember getting up and leaving class, going back to my dorm room to do something that there was no return from, to end my own life. And when I got outside, nothing externally seemed to match everything that I was feeling internally. Instead, the sun shone down amazingly, the sky was a brilliant shade of blue, and nothing just made sense. And with every step I took toward my dorm, I just had so much trouble coming to grips with the decision that I had made. And I was overcome with emotion and overwhelmed by the thought of what I was about to do. And so I sat down outside at a table and chair in a common area, and I buried my face in my hands, and I did the only thing that in that moment I could think to do, which was pray. To a God I wasn't even sure heard me, to a God I wasn't even sure existed. And I cried out internally, and I began to beg God that if he were listening, to just send me one friend, just one person who would listen to me, who would understand what I was going through, because I was about to do something that there was no coming back from. And it was about that time that I heard a voice behind me say, excuse me. And thinking that the voice wasn't meant for me, I heard it again, louder, excuse me, until finally I turned around and found a man standing before me that I had never seen before in my life. And he smiled at me and asked if he could sit down. And in true introverted fashion, I looked around at all of the other tables and chairs and thought, you could literally sit anywhere. But in true introverted fashion, I simply said, okay. And so he sat down and he began to unpack his book bag and he kept smiling at me. And what he said next changed the course of my life forever. He said, look, please don't get up. Please don't leave. What I'm going to say next is going to sound crazy. Don't freak out. But I was just walking across campus and I noticed you sitting by yourself. And I felt, I felt like God said, maybe that person needs a friend. So I thought that I would come over here and check on you. I have just one question for you. Are you okay? The answer, of course, was no. And so I froze, stunned by his words, because there is absolutely no way he could have known. Instead, we talked for hours. And needless to say, that day, I did not make a decision to end my own life. I made a friend named Mark. I would spend the next few years of my life healing, going through school. I would come to faith. I joined and even hosted a weekly Bible study on campus. I started taking care of myself mentally, spiritually, physically. I began seeing a therapist again for my past abuse. And best of all, I started dating somebody. And things were really looking up. I mean, I was leaving my tormented past behind me and embracing all the possibilities of the future. And everything was going great until one day. One day, a chance encounter brought me face to face again with a person who had sexually abused me nearly 20 years earlier. Standing in front of them again after all of that time, all of the pain, all of the anger, all of the rage came flooding back, overwhelming each of my senses, doing everything to keep me chained to my five-year-old self. I had had nearly two decades to think about what I would say to this person if I ever saw them again. And believe me when I tell you that I was well-practiced. I could tell them how they had robbed me of my childhood. I could tell them how they had stripped me of my innocence. I could tell them how because of what they had done, I wasn't sure that anyone would ever really love me. And I could tell them how because of what they had done, I wasn't sure that I could ever love myself. 
I could tell them how because of what they had done, one day I had nearly ended my own life. I could tell them a lot of things. And in that moment, I realized I had a massive decision to make. Let go on a tirade full of all the hatred and anger and bitterness that I had carried with me for nearly 20 years, or I could do something different. I could say something different. I could offer forgiveness now. The same forgiveness that was offered me when I came to faith. And so that day, I did something that I never thought that I would be capable of doing. I got right up in my abuser's face. I looked them right in their eyes and I simply said, I forgive you. I forgive you. I remember it well because that was the day that I finally gained my freedom. I became free. That's what happened. Here's what didn't happen. All of that anger, all of that pain, all of that rage didn't just disappear. Nothing changed in that moment, really, except for this feeling that all of the emotional weight and trauma that I had carried with me into adulthood now somehow felt different. It felt lighter. And as time passed, I quickly realized that I no longer had to get over what happened to me because now I could get through it. And that's when I had a revelation that forgiveness wasn't necessarily for the person that I had forgiven. Forgiveness was for me. Because forgiveness is a key that unlocks a cell in which you were prisoner the entire time. Some of you have been hurt so badly by others in your past, you're probably thinking that there's no way that you could ever forgive them. I understand. I was there because I didn't understand what real forgiveness was. And if like me, you're not sure what real forgiveness is, we can start by examining what real forgiveness is not. Because forgiveness is not a pass. Forgiveness is not condoning another person's actions. Forgiveness doesn't mean that what they did didn't matter or didn't hurt because it did matter and it did hurt. Forgiveness doesn't mean removing a healthy boundary and allowing a toxic, manipulative, or even dangerous person back into your life. Forgiveness doesn't mean removing accountability or responsibility. And forgiveness doesn't mean that it won't still hurt sometimes. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you won't still have what happened to you. Forgiveness just means that what happened to you won't have you. Forgiveness is often a gradual and ongoing process, one that may need to be repeated multiple times, even if just to yourself. Did you know that the other person doesn't even need to be present in order to be forgiven? In cases where that person is too toxic or dangerous, or maybe they've moved on or even passed away, they don't even need to know that you've forgiven them just as long as you do. Because the reality is that forgiveness can be just as much, if not more so for you than for anybody. And it's okay for forgiveness to be about you because forgiveness gives you freedom, freedom from the one who hurt you. We often talk about the transformative power of pain, so we cannot forget about the transformative power of forgiveness because that's what forgiveness does. It transforms you from the incarcerated into the liberated. But if you're hell-bent on revenge, if you're dead set on carrying resentment, just know that unforgiveness is like taking a poison pill and waiting for the other person to die. You'll only end up hurting yourself and you deserve to be free. So every day that you carry around unforgiveness is another day added to a prison sentence that you don't deserve. As one Hiroshima bomb survivor put it, the best way to avenge your enemies is by learning to forgive. I've forgiven multiple people in my life, multiple times for a multitude of things. And so it may surprise you to know that of all of the people that I've ever forgiven, my abuser included, there was still one person from whom I continually withheld forgiveness. And that person was me. Now make no mistake, I did not need to forgive myself for my sexual abuse. What happened to me was not my fault. I was the victim, but as a survivor, I needed to forgive myself for years of self-doubt. I needed to forgive myself for years of negative self-talk. I needed to forgive myself for years of thinking that I would never be good enough. I needed to forgive myself for years of thinking that I would never be enough because the reality is that I am enough. 
And if I was capable of God's love and forgiveness, then surely I was capable of my own. So one day I looked in the mirror and I forgave the person who had suffered most through all of this, me. Today, my life is dramatically different. I no longer live in shame because there is nothing for me to be ashamed of. I live proudly as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I've been married to my beautiful bride for nearly 15 years, and together we have an amazing 10-year-old daughter. I'm a husband, and I'm a father. Those things did not come easily to me. I had to fight to be successful at them. But I stand before you today as living proof of the transformative power of forgiveness. And today, today I get to use my voice to raise awareness for childhood sexual abuse and sexual assault. And today I get to use my voice to lend volume to survivors who might be suffering in silence. And if you're a survivor of childhood sexual abuse or sexual assault like me, just know that what happened to you is not your fault. If you're a survivor like me, know that I am safe to talk to, that I believe you and I believe in you. If you're a survivor like me, know that you are loved, you are enough, and you are never alone. There is help, there is hope, and there is healing. A life beyond measure is possible, and it can start today with forgiveness, because forgiveness is ultimately a choice, one that you get to make. So when faced with that decision, what will you choose? Will you choose to forgive? Thank you.